In a home in Pelican Park, a young girl has dinner with her family, laughing and happily existing in the humble, warm space they all called home. Unbeknownst to her, just a few doors away, a man was watching her, observing her every movement, a dark plan brewing in his mind. When the perfect moment came, he would not hesitate to unleash a sickening chain of events that would forever change the lives of so many. This is the heartbreaking case of Michaela Williams. Hello and welcome to Murder and Mayhem, South African True Crime, with me, your host, Bella Monsoon. So, here's what I've been up to in 90 right seconds. Now is Bella Monsoon. Now, she is a multimedia digital content creator and the plug for all things South African True Crime, current affairs, and of course, colourful hair. <laughs> so, let's give her a big feel. Go, welcome! Yeah. Together? So I initially kept my life very different. So I had my mental health aspect, my professional career, and then I had my content creation. And uh, about two years ago, I started to actually incorporate it because I found people were very interested in understanding a little bit more about how the mind works. And I think with the state of mental health in the country and the world in general, there's a very big emphasis to actually destigmatize mental illness and also normalize seeking help when we need it. Yes. So I think it's really important to align those interests and those passions of mine with my content. And then from live television to an off-grid escape, which was definitely needed. A wood-fired jacuzzi, sunset deck, luxurious yurt, a chill net, a pizza oven, and it was pet friendly. I mean, could it get any better? It's safe to say everyone had an amazing time. And then it was back to the grid, I suppose, to a South African TV series premiere with an actress that some of you may find familiar. And of course, a lot has happened in between, but these were the main events in a nutshell. So now that you're all caught up, let's get back into it. I I know it's been a minute and I'm definitely trying to be more consistent, but it is difficult being a one-woman show. Which leads me to this. So whilst I have a handle on the more short-form content that I post almost daily onto TikTok, the missing persons cases, the true crime updates in South Africa, and so on and so forth, I do need to bring someone on board to assist me with the long-form content editing. So if you are someone or if you know someone, please do get in contact. My email address will be on screen now. Please feel free to send me your portfolio or a link to some of the work you have completed, and we can take it from there. But back to the episode. Today's case may be difficult to hear for some. Due to not only the actions that were inflicted, but the fact that the victim of this heinous crime was a child, a young girl. If this is one that you would prefer to set out, I totally understand and I will catch you in the next episode. And for those of you who are new to the channel, I'm about to introduce myself and tell you who I am and what I do. You know the drill, if you're returning, you can use the timestamp to skip ahead. So here it is in a nutshell. I'm a registered mental health professional who just so happens to be obsessed with a makeup, true crime and uncovering the motives that drive people to do what they do. My intimate knowledge and experience within the field led me to create the first trauma-informed South African true crime series. Thus, weekly, mostly that is, I post new videos looking at real-life crimes from a psychological viewpoint. During these episodes, I also try to share psychological knowledge and concepts that you may or may not be aware of in an easy-to-understand format. So, if all of that sounds like something that is right up your alley, then please do consider subscribing and joining the Balibu family. But if you're more a fan of podcasts, no worries, I got you covered. You can find me for my sister podcast, Murder and Mayhem, South African True Crime, available to stream on all major streaming channels. So just a quick disclaimer for today's episode. Today's narrative contains material citing sexual assault and murder of a minor. As always, I mean absolutely no disrespect to any of the victims mentioned nor their families. The purpose of this video is to shed further light on the heinous crime that was was committed while spreading awareness about the psychological nature of the narrative. This episode has been thoroughly researched by myself and includes, where available, real-life accounts, footage and images of and from individuals involved directly in the case. So, without further delay, 
let's get into it. Our narrative centers around one girl in particular, Michaela Serena Williams. She was born on the 17th of August 2007 in Cape Town, South Africa. She grew up with an older brother and later in her childhood she would also help to welcome to the family a baby sister. Although growing up in humble surroundings, she was loved and had everything she needed. In 2020, Michaela was starting grade 6 at Buck Road Primary School in Lotus River. She was living with her mother Beatrice, her mother's husband Alistair, her older brother Ashley and her baby sister who was three years old at the time. The family lived on Crane Street, New Horizon in Pelican Park. Michaela was full of life. She loved animals and dancing at the local church ministry. She also thoroughly enjoyed doing her schoolwork. Not exactly a common interest for others her age. She was polite and helpful and everyone who came into contact with her was instantly captivated by her bubbly nature and humor. And so it was in this space that she existed in a state of contentment until the 7th of January 2020 dawned. This was the day that a man would bring a tragic end to a life that had barely just begun. This man was also from Pelican Park and he had been visiting a friend in Lotus River that day. After arriving back at his place of residence, he observed a young girl along with some of her family members having dinner in their enclosed garden. He knew the girl and her family as he was their direct neighbor living just a few doors away from them. A plan that had been lurking for a while began to fully form within his mind. And this young girl was none other than Michaela Williams. At the time, she had been with her brother, his girlfriend, and her cousin. When she was by herself outside for a short period of time, the man had approached her, telling her that he was going to buy her a birthday present. She had not responded, but she had gone back into her house. At the time, her mother had just gone to bathe and then began bathing her younger sister. During this time, Michaela had left with a friend to go to the local tuck shop in their area. Not a strange occurrence in the least. When she had returned to her home, though, there was a police van in the area. As is often the case in these more close-knit community-based areas, people had gathered around the vehicle, curious to know what was going on. During this commotion, this man saw the perfect opportunity, approaching Michaela and this time offering to buy her cake and chocolate, if she would take a walk with him to the shops to get it. She decided to take him up on his offer. After all, he wasn't a complete stranger. He was the neighbor that she often saw around their area. As she walked away with him in her black skirt, orange top and brown sandals, this would be the last time that anyone would see her. At first she walked willingly, but as more time elapsed and upon reaching 9th Avenue and faced with a road crossing, she refused to go any further. They had been walking at this point for almost two kilometers. Upon her hesitation, the man had grabbed her, pulled her across the road and forced her into the back area of the vacant plot on the corner of 9th Avenue and Scarp Road. It was on this abandoned vacant plot that that this man would commit multiple heinous crimes against his innocent victim. Terrified at this point, Michaela would begin to scream, and so the man placed his hand over her mouth. She struggled, attempting to break free, and fell to the ground. The man ripped at her orange top as he grabbed at her, before placing his hands around her small neck. She continued to fight for her life, flailing and ultimately knocking the glasses off of his face, which caused his nose to begin bleeding. Infuriated, he had then choked her, with the clothing she had been wearing until she lost consciousness. And the brutality continued, as Michaela's hands were tied behind her back with her very own top, and she was placed on the ground on her stomach. The man, who would later admit to being HIV positive, then began to as he had started, she regained consciousness, most likely due to the excruciating pain that she was experiencing, and so she began to scream. He then pulled off her skirt and tied it around her neck. As he choked the life out of her, he continued his sexual violation of her little body. When he was finally done with his despicable deeds, he dropped two blocks of concrete onto her head to ensure that she was dead. He would later say that he did this because he knew she was going to be able to identify him. He also made sure to check that she was really dead, as he had learned from the mistakes in his past. But more on that shortly. He then disguised her body with a blanket, tree branches, and grass that was lying in the vicinity. And with that, he was off. To where exactly, you may ask? Well, to go and assist the search party that had gathered, of course. Mm-hmm. 
You see, whilst he had been gone, Michaela's family had discovered around 7pm that she was missing after she failed to return home from the shops. They then began to frantically search. Her mother had gone door to door, visiting all of her daughter's friends' homes in the hopes that the little girl was there. The fact that it was also load shedding in the area only made this task so much harder. That very same evening, Michaela was reported officially missing at the Grassy Park police station. However, a little girl from the neighborhood would later report that she last saw Michaela walking away with an adult man who lived just in their street. But when the community had gone looking for this individual, he wasn't home. The community continued frantically searching and missing posters were shared on multiple social media platforms. Later the next day, the man's sister would tell him that the police were looking for him. He would later give his nephew, this very same sister's son, his ring and his phone, as well as a message for his sister to tell her to let police know to meet him at ShopRite. And an hour later, he was collected and taken into custody. It was there that he would immediately confess to the and murder of the little girl, later leading police to Michaela's body. And then the news became public. The community was left horrified and in uproar. And this collective anger would only intensify when the full narrative of this man came to light. And so before we get into the aftermath of the murder, it's time that we meet the perpetrator. The man from down the road, the man that so many knew, was Stephen Fortune. Stephen Fortune was 48 years old at the time of his arrest, and he was no stranger to the law. In 2017, Stephen had been released from prison on parole after serving time for a and attempted murder conviction. Sorry, what? Yep, this was not his first rodeo. Yeah. Let me explain. On the 26th of February 2005, he had lured an eight-year-old girl from her home in Hyde Park informal settlement Tafelsilch Mitchell's Plain to Kailicha Cemetery. On the day of the incident just earlier, the little girl had gone to the local tuck shop to buy a bumpy, basically an ice lolly. But then she just did not return home. And later, her family would discover the horrific reason why. When he had seen this little girl out of her home, he had approached her and asked her to accompany him to collect money from a friend's house, telling her that her parents knew that she was in his company. You see, Stephen knew her family quite well, and he was someone who not only ran errands for them, but he also spent time in their home. So this story that he had told her was quite believable. He had then put her on his shoulders and continued walking until they had reached the cemetery. There she had attempted to get off, but he did not let her. In the overgrown bushes of the quiet area, he then raped her, choked her, strangled her, and stabbed her in the heart with a pair of scissors. Lying in the overgrown bushes of the graveyard, the little girl had passed out, losing consciousness after the beatings. When she finally woke up, her eyes were bloodshot and blurry and she could barely breathe. Miraculously though, the little girl had thought on her feet and she pretended to play dead and held her breath. She had continued pretending, even when Stephen had returned to take her underwear and shoes as trophies. He had also lifted up her body to make sure that she was dead. He had then finally left. It would be 12 hours later when she was certain he was gone for good that she was able to crawl out of the bushes, weak and bleeding, to find help. At that point, she couldn't even walk and she was using sticks to help navigate her way. Luckily, residents of the area who came across her knew her and they had called her mother immediately. It would also come to light that much like how he would act with Michaela assisting her family to try and find her, he did the same thing with this little girl's family. Absolutely sickening to say the least, but it's not uncommon for perpetrators to embed themselves into investigations and searches. The latest case that has been blowing up South African news, the Jocelyn Smith case, is evidence of this. But I digress. When she was rushed to hospital, doctors told her family that she was just minutes away from death. She would later undergo heart surgery too. It would ultimately be her testimony that would sentence Stephen to 20 years in prison. However, in 2017, just 12 years after that brutal attack, for some reason he was granted parole. 
The mother of his first victim was in and out of the parole board offices warning them that this man was dangerous. She was then even told by one officer that they had actually lost track of where Stephen was. Yeah, I kid you not. Imagine the level of fear and trauma one would have knowing that the man who attacked them was free again. She lived in constant fear as it was ultimately her testimony that sent Stephen to jail. And it would be through his next offence that made the news that he was thrust back into her life again. In the middle of January 2020, Stephen made his first court appearance at Weinberg Magistrates Court, where he was met with obvious outcry from the community who had gathered. With a packed courtroom, Michaela's mother was overcome with emotion when the time came to finally face her daughter's alleged killer, hysterically crying and being consoled by her husband and family members. After suffering from a panic attack, she was ultimately escorted from the courtroom before Stephen had even arrived. When he finally did arrive, he was wearing a yellow t-shirt and a pair of glasses, amongst other things, and he ensured that he kept his head down and avoided eye contact with everyone in the room. And as with many of these kinds of cases where there is massive community outcry, Stephen did not even attempt to apply for bail. And at the time of this first appearance, there was actually a court order in place to ensure that his photograph and name was not published until the investigation was complete. Those in the courtroom were infuriated and screamed at Stephen as he exited the dock, screaming in Afrikaans, and I quote, Pig, you rubbish, you are evil. He was then charged with a Schedule 6 offence as the murder had been planned and premeditated. He faced two counts of one of kidnapping and one count of murder. And then the pandemonium of 2020 struck. Subsequent sessions during the period of lockdown were done via AVR from Polesmore Prison as attendance was limited in court sessions. The case was then postponed to June and the perpetrator, aka Stephen, had still not been publicly named. This had further frustrated Beatrice, Michaela's mother, who couldn't understand why it felt as though Stephen was having his identity protected and it also confused her as to what more needed to be investigated. She had said, And I quote, Counseling has been offered, but what will that do? It won't stop this heartache. I can talk to thousands of people. It won't change this empty space. The post-mortem conducted on her body showed that the cause of death was a combination of blunt force trauma to the head and ligature compression of the neck. After several delays, supporters, friends and relatives would hear the chilling account of Michaela's last moments, straight from the lips of Stephen himself. He also admitted to raping and sodomizing the young girl before he committed the premeditated murder. Stephen Fortune was eventually found guilty in December of 2020. In the months that would follow, prior to his sentencing, he was sent for a 30-day evaluation at Falkenberg Psychiatric Hospital. This was to determine whether he would be declared a dangerous criminal. And it was during this period of time that far more disturbing information would come to light, if you can even believe it. Whilst in Falkenberg Psychiatric Hospital, Stephen would admit to doctors and psychiatrists that he had raped around 9 or 10 other young girls whilst he was out on parole between 2017 and 2020. Yes, you did hear me correctly. Dr. Mark Roffey of the institution would state that Stephen's alleged spree only came to an end when he was arrested after Michaela's murder. He also concluded that if Stephen was released back into the community, he would commit the same crimes, and there were no signs that he would change if he was reinstated into society. Back in court and with this expert testimony, he was thus declared a dangerous criminal as per the Criminal Procedures Act. The court would also hear from the parole officer who had not taken action against Stephen when he broke his parole conditions. Yes, I did just say there was inaction after breaking parole conditions. You see, Stephen had initially lived in his brother's home, about five doors away from his first victim, before moving to Pelican Park. Besides the fact that the victim nor her family were actually informed of his release, him being in Mitchell's plane altogether was a violation of his parole conditions. He was supposed 
used to have an electronic tag fitted to track and monitor his movements, but that was never done. Honestly, I'm not even surprised at this point. The parole officer, Wayne Lecure, would also later apologize to the families of the victims. The first victim, who was 24 years old at that point in time, wrote a letter which her mother read to the court, as she was too traumatized to face her attacker. She had said, and I quote, All wounds were reopened when I read in the Daily Voice about Michaela's story. It sounded like mine. No one told me that he's been released. The system failed me. I felt like I was stabbed in my heart. He should have stayed in prison. Michaela would not be dead if he remained in prison. After multiple delays, on the 14th of June 2021, Stephen Fortune was given three life sentences, along with seven years for two counts of murder and kidnapping. He was also declared unfit to own a firearm and his name was to be added to the sex offenders registry. Here in South Africa though that registry is not available to the public as it is in places like the US for example. The judge in the case Robert Henney would later tell the court that Stephen was one of the most evil individuals that he had ever come across. He would say, and I quote, I don't have the right words. He is a blatant evil monster. In all my 30 years as a judicial officer, this is one of the most evil individuals I have come across, who admitted he cannot get enough of young girls. He is a danger to society, and the society must be protected from him. Michaela's mother had said after the sentencing was heard, and I quote, After the judge read out the third life sentence, I was overcome with joy. Words cannot explain how I felt at that moment. I wanted to scream and cry at the same time. The sentencing brings closure for us as a family. And in regards to Stephen's initial victim, that eight-year-old girl, she had also said, and I quote, I believe that this girl, now 25 years old, can finally start her life afresh without having to look over her shoulder. She is free from living in fear of Stephen Fortune. So to rewind just a little bit and move from the courtroom and the case back to Michaela, on the 25th of January 2020, Michaela had been laid to rest. Family and community gathered by her home to pay their respects before her white coffin was carried out of the house to the church in Kudu Avenue, Lotus River. In the church, hundreds of mourners gathered as a projector showcased happy moments from Michaela's life. After her eulogy, a beautiful poem was read by her friends and classmates. They had said, and I quote, We think of you in silence. We often speak your name. All we have is memories and your picture in a frame. Michaela, God has you in his keeping and you will forever be in our hearts. Her body was then laid to rest at the Clip Road Cemetery. Her brother Ashley, who was 20 years old in 2020, composed a rap that was dedicated to the memory of his sister. Ironically, his songwriting and music making was encouraged by the very same neighbor who would ultimately take the life of his little sister. Some of the lyrics of his rap included, and I quote, Damn, I miss you already. The love you give. You rough. You tough. You couldn't get enough of life. Easily trust. But damn, we all trust easily. We get disappointed or stabbed in the back. You took her from us. It's unfair. I hope you rot where you're at. Psychopath, yes, she is in a better place. But the memories we have, I will always remember. And the truth is, that is what Michaela is now. A memory. A life ripped so prematurely from this earth. In the aftermath of Michaela's death, playtime sessions with children from the local communities were held. During these sessions, awareness around child safety was also raised. Often children are not able to simply play freely outside because of the gang violence in the area. These sessions also taught children about inappropriate interactions as well as not to speak to strangers amongst other things. Uncomfortable but necessary topics and conversations to have in all homes and communities. Is especially in this day and age. Because let's face it, it is evident within society, especially here in South Africa, 
that there is a massive problem. The system is broken. The four words you will often hear when discussing the legal and criminal system in South Africa. It's evident that no one in power is serious about the ever-rising crime rates against women and children. And it's evident that the parole system needs a hell of a lot of improvement. Although no definite figures for the recidivism rate are known, it's thought to be as high as 85%. But what exactly Exactly about it is so broken though. Did you know that South Africa has the largest prison population on the continent with around 157,000 incarcerated people as of March 2023? Yet there is an evident lack of adequate rehabilitation programs to start with. Many inmates within South African prisons do not have access to programs that address the root causes of their criminal behavior. Couple that lack of structure with the issue of overcrowding and it's not conducive to positive change. According to recent data, correctional services in South Africa receive a budget of over 25 billion rand a year. Of that, 78% is allocated to incarceration and administration, yet only 12% is spent on rehabilitation, skills programs and social integration. So why such skewed spending, you may wonder? Well, besides corruption, that is. It probably has something to do with the fact that our prisons are at least 30% over capacity. And at least 10 prisons in the country have an occupancy rate of over 200%. The situation is attributed to court backlogs, administrative burdens, minimum sentences, limited access to mandatory pre-release programs, and prolonged pre-trial detention, sometimes lasting multiple years. I mean, just think about the cases that I cover and how long it ultimately takes for them to reach a verdict. The number of people sentenced to life in prison increased by over 4,000% between 1995 and 2022. The living conditions, limited access to resources and social support all contribute to the cycle of reoffending. With no access to resources in prison and a lack of support outside of prison, there's often a struggle to reintegrate into society after release. Due to the socioeconomic situation in the country, it's a fact that many individuals who are incarcerated are from disadvantaged backgrounds. They have limited access to education, employment opportunities and support systems. These factors can contribute to criminal behavior and make it difficult for individuals to break the cycle of reoffending. During a documentary I once watched, an inmate at Polesmore Prison, home to some of the most vile and dangerous criminals the country has seen, described the prison as a warehouse for criminals, stating that many came in for misdemeanors or petty theft, but there they had not only learned about how to conduct more serious crimes, but they also had the chance to join a gang. Prison can be more alluring than discouraging for some, depending especially on where you are based in the country. The Numbers Gang, which started as a prison gang, is highly prolific within the Western Cape and operates largely from within the confines of prison. Depending on the type of crime committed on the outside, it's possible to be initiated into one of the gangs or even to rise up the ranks. Often, it is also a matter of survival for those who find themselves on the inside. For many who join prison gangs, it's often difficult to break those ties when released, even if they want to. More often than not, more criminal behavior and networking, if you will, takes place within the confines of those prison walls, leading the convicted criminals to maintain and in some cases increase their level of criminality. Look, the truth of the matter is, without addressing the issues and factors that lead so many down the path of crimes, the chances of changing the narrative are slim. I'm talking about things like substance abuse problems, unhealthy family dynamics, and an overall lack of support in general, in addition to the aforementioned factors. Add to that the stigma and discrimination that is associated with being incarcerated, and of course the mental health issues that so many have inside or develop whilst in prison. And you know the worst part about this? Our justice system not only fails victims and survivors of violence by often giving perpetrators a slap on the wrist, but when they ultimately release these individuals back into society, they fail to let their victims know about these parole processes. I mean, I don't even know how often it is that I hear that victims and families of victims are only made aware that a perpetrator has been released 
because of social media or because of the newspapers? What is that? Addressing these factors through comprehensive and evidence-based interventions is crucial to reducing recidivism rates and supporting individuals in breaking the cycle of criminal behavior. Don't get me wrong though, I am by no means excusing or making light of the actions that led these individuals to end up where they did. Regardless of all of these factors, harming another person is never a solution and deserves the adequate punishment. Individuals like Stephen Fortune should be evaluated far more harshly before even being considered for parole release. I'm talking about individuals who have actively demonstrated a strong desire to inflict pain and suffering onto others especially children. I mean, it's evident by Stephen's confessions and his target victims that he was far too interested in young girls and viewed them in a sexual manner. To those unaware, this is the hallmark of a sexual predator, and more importantly, one who is engaged in pedophilia. Studies show that the vast majority of child sexual abuse perpetrators are male. It is also true that the majority of children who are the victims of such individuals often knew and trusted their perpetrators. And now I'm sure I know what you're thinking, but Stephen, however, was not diagnosed by clinicians as having pedophilia disorder. Perhaps because one of the main components to this disorder is feeling some form of anxiety, shame or guilt that is linked to the minors that these individuals are attracted to. And it is not clear whether such feelings or emotions were experienced by Stephen at any point in time. He did however showcase many tendencies, disturbing attractions to minors and engaging in sexual actions with these minors. He also did not express any restraint in fulfilling his desires either, posing a massive danger to society. A danger that was overlooked and underestimated. A danger that resulted in a lost life and a changed destiny for so many. And unfortunately, Michaela's story wasn't the first and will most likely not be the last. Every year, more dangerous criminals are released back into the streets, back into society to unsuspecting suspecting communities. Take for example Mohideen Pangakar, who was in and out of jail throughout his life for various offences before ultimately taking the life of little Tasne von Veik. She was only 8 years old at the time. I covered her story in December of 2022. And then of course there's Cameron Wilson, who was actually out on bail when he ended up brutally taking the life of Lakita Moore. She was only 18 years old at the time. I covered that case in February of 2022. And in many of these cases, as I earlier mentioned, the victims, the survivors and their families are often not consulted or notified prior to these individuals being released back into society. And often they find out via the media or even social media. I mean, take for example, Alison bought his attackers. Besides the obvious trauma of unintentionally running into or being faced by the person who harmed you or your family, the lack of control over those paroled is worrying, to say the least. And I've often heard this conversation lead to a debate on whether the death penalty should be reinstated. So what do you think? Do you think it would result in less innocent lives being lost? Or... Do you think it would be quite the opposite? But until tangible change can and will be achieved, we will hold on to the memories of those who have fallen. Keep the narratives of those we have lost alive. Be a voice for the voiceless. For Tasne, for Lakita, for Michaela Williams. They will never be forgotten. They will never be just another number. So until the next episode, stay safe. Stay blessed and stay the amazing human beings that I know each and every single one of you are. Bye!